I thank uh, Professor Sato for laying a good, strong, and enduring foundation uh, for my presentation, in the sense that entire economic history of India background he has provided, from Tokugawa period to Meiji period, uh, Intova period, up to World War, then straight away into uh, 80s, 90s, until the car age. Uh, I consider that as the base on which I can speak. One, number two, uh, some gaps uh, in the process I attempt to fill up. Uh, usually, uh, in India-Japan conferences, uh, especially the economic dimension session, uh, has any number of uh, overlapping points. Uh, to that extent, I would like to avoid repetition from mine. For example, even the very first session where Professor Horimoto Sensei made presentation, there were quite a considerable part of the economic aspects of the bilateral relations. Uh, well, my gist is, I have already presented my full article, uh, also all the slides. Uh, the gist is how India, as a supplier country to Japanese economic expansion, especially in the post-World War II period, uh, has helped India now become a partner uh, with Japan. Uh, Whatever extent we might emphasize other aspects of our bilateral relations, still it is economics dominated all the way, all the way. Uh, whenever we speak economic dimensions of India-Japan bilateral relations, we consider trade, uh, foreign direct investment, and ODA. ODA is unavoidable uh, as far as Asian relations with Japan is concerned. With Colombo plan began Japanese ODA. Of course, now uh, post Olympics uh, in Beijing, uh, there was a lot of expectation that India would receive a uh, lot of ODA again from Japan uh, after even Indonesia. Till then, it was China and Indonesia which used to receive a lot of ODA. And uh, all the Chinese did was they grabbed entire. Uh, facilities of infrastructure uh, during Olympics, thanks to Japanese construction efficiency, then said, you go interior China and develop. Japanese said, uh, how do we get profit from developing infrastructure in interior Japan? That was not possible, so they exit. A beneficiary was India to quite an extent. Plus, uh, in India, even ODA deployment has seen sectoral change. You know, earlier, it was only in the uh, port outer expansion and iron ore extraction where Japanese investment to went, and we were exporting in a big way only iron ore. That was during the Japanese reconstruction phase immediately after war. Then, you know, importing manufacturing from Japan, especially electrical, electronics now, and uh, Japan since had transited to post-industrial society, that is from production of consumer goods to production of producer goods. So that's where India did benefit. So background I would uh, totally try to avoid. As for mechanisms for bilateral relations, we had uh, India-Japan Study Committee housed in planning commission for a long time, till recently. Probably the last uh, <coughs> Uh, Deputy Chairman of Planning Commission presently, uh, Montek Singh Alavalia, used to be the chairperson of India-Japan Study Committee. Uh, previous to him was Dr. G.T. Maya from Karnataka, who advised seven chief ministers on economic matters. I used to be advisor to G.T. Maya on India-Japan Study Committee. Uh, since then, it is commerce that has played more important role with Japan. Therefore, we moved the committee to Ministry of Commerce in India. And Montek Singh Aliyal is the last uh, chairperson of that committee. That was one mechanism. Uh, since last six years, we have prime minister level annual summits, uh, alternately in Tokyo and New Delhi, which has been a, a regular feature now. And we would never miss either a Japanese minister coming to India or our prime minister visiting. Plus, we had two plus two, we have Raksha Mantri uh, meetings. Uh, 
coming to ODA, uh, there are two main categories. One is the grant part, another is uh, loan part. Loan dominates. Grant is very little. Uh, that loan which goes to help environmental sector has low interest rate, 1.5%, whereas the one that goes to other sectors has 1.8%, though it is marginal, but considering the huge amount, it's quite considerable. Mm, some of the educational sector assistance of ODA, I can quote Indira Gandhi Open University, New Delhi, probably 100 crore rupee worth of project EMPC, Electronic Media Production Center. Uh, that is totally Japanese ODA funded. Uh, subsequently, uh, Yamuna cleaning, Ganga cleaning, all environment. I think uh, in that sector there is still scope. Uh, however much you clean Indian river borders, still pollution you cannot avoid. So it will be an enduring thing to tie up with Japanese for this. Mm, Professor Sato mentioned DMIC, which is really the proud project that India is partnering with Japan, spanning across six states, from Delhi to Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, even Maharashtra. I think any time you drive to, towards Jaipur, you cannot avoid seeing a new expressway being inaugurated almost every month once. Uh, DMIC is a huge project. When conceived, it was 45 billion worth. Due to cost escalation, delay in project in investment, it has now almost hit 90 billion dollars. Uh, Japan was kind enough uh, last year when uh, Surida Ajin Noza uh, visited India. Uh, Five billion dollars were released to us. His first question was, what arrangement has India made to procure other part of the loan for the project. India had not made any. There was none. So there are some hiccups, meaning India-Japan bilateral relations has certain puzzles, certain problems, definitely certain prospects. We need to address all the three parts. Uh, parallel to DMIC, it is ridden with certain political problems of different parties in different states. If the need be, I'll return, otherwise not. Mm, then CBIC is all too important. There is a Chennai-Bangalore industrial corridor. Probably Satasan left it for me, I think. Uh, this is to mm, cover a variety of uh, infrastructural projects between Chennai city, including in and around China city, uh, then up to Bangalore. Problem are complaint was that uh, though Karnataka is the destination for the project, it has nothing to do for infrastructure development inside Karnataka. Only 60 kilometers from Bangalore to West Tamil Nadu is all the place for Karnataka. So Karnataka state had certain uh, requests, very strong ones, to extend it up to Tumko, which really is an industrial uh, city, plus a suburban for industrial plan for Bangalore. Now to up to Chitra Durga, which borders Andhra Pradesh. It can further go to Hyderabad. So Andhra could be brought in. Karnataka can have extension. This has been almost cleared by Karnataka government. Even Indian Union cabinet has cleared it. And recently, JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, which is the implementation authority for Japanese ODA, has visited. We had a meeting in Delhi. Uh, he confessed to me that Chidambaram, Jay Lalita, very supportive of this project. I think we can expect. So, advantage is Chennai, Bangalore, just 400 kilometer. Even if you include Chitra Durga, not more than 500. Whereas, Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, 1384 kilometer. 90 billion dollars, maybe add another few. It would take another 20 years, though 2017 is the deadline, it is not going to meet. China Bangalore, just 400 kilometers. You can realize quite early, Japanese are very hopeful. 
so supportive of this. I think the, but unfortunately, always we emphasize number one, trade between India and Japan. It has not picked up. It has not picked up. We were always considered under 5 billion figure. But it had hit 18 billion dollars. That's what Prime Minister announced. Figure related to previous year, not the current year. 13.84 billion current. Of which 6.5 billion dollars is the surplus Japan enjoys. Or India has deficit. Our exports to Japan and the deficit in the bilateral trade is almost equal, 6.5 billion dollars. What good of trade we talk? What good of trade relations we talk? I think we need to reconsider trade itself. But IT sector has made a difference in the last uh, few years, whereas about $360 billion worth of IT trade between the two countries. Um, there are 73 Indian IT companies located in Japan. Except four of them, nobody is making profit. China factor, here also you can talk. China offers 18 to 20 percent of discount to orders placed by Japanese company for China in software. India is a bit expensive. But Chinese companies have no ISO certificates. Indian companies have. Due to economic recession in Japan, they looked for discounts in China. But gradually, we have a chance they would return. Then Indian export items petroleum products, iron ore, gems, jewelry. Post Gujarat earthquake, gems, jewelry down. You know? And now Japanese graduating to electronics industry. So iron ore requirement down. Still Indian iron ore quality is not bad. But Japanese are refusing to increase even by one dollar per ton the price. We hold meetings, no success. Then Indian uh, because of their trade surplus they enjoy, we have more products coming in. There are some scope in future, but uh, uh, we have to wait for that. Uh, comprehensive economic partnership agreement, SEPA, had been uh, told, but 94% of tariff on both sides will have a, uh, rather we remove uh, tariffs on 94% of products but it will take 10 years to actualize that. Uh, post that 10 years, I think we have better chance for improving trade prospects. Then ODA. Chennai finished. Uh, you know, when in the 73, post 73, uh, Please, sir, remind me when my time approaches, maybe one minute before. Now, post-1973 oil crisis, Japan did deploy all their obsolete technology in Southeast Asia. They graduated to better technology. Continuous R&D in Japan has helped that, in the sense that there is a 78% of Japanese private sector investment in R&D whereas government contribution is very little. In case of India, it is reverse. No? It's reverse in case of India. So all the newer technologies that are observed, absorbed in Japanese industry help them. Yes, sir. Oh, five minutes, that's more than enough. Oh, you know, what vertical production alliance system with the Japanese created in the Asia Pacific has helped region to develop. There is a greater extent of intra-regional trade in Southeast Asia, so that Japanese could always pump in their technology, invest their capital. And technology surplus, capital surplus, despite economic recession in the last 20 years, still is to Japanese advantage. That is what we are looking for. We are always the recipients of Japanese kindness. You know, we have very little to return. Now, reviving Japanese economy is most important challenge. Abenomics is coming in, sending arrows. Number one, creating inflation at 2%. Yes. Number three, reducing public debt. 248% of GDP 
is a public debt, which Japanese owes. Now, how to reduce that? It is one of bad examples in the world, even amongst the OECD countries, to have such a high public debt. And third one is uh, easy money policy. That is, lending to the extent even not possible, or even may not be necessary. So there is a total absence of domestic demand in Japan to create that, make money easily and hugely. I think success of Abenomics, this is uh, term so, is necessary to help revive the Japanese economy. Luckily, in both houses of the parliament, there's National Diet, LDP, the party which uh, Abe belongs to, uh, dominates, meaning they got majority. Uh, with their coalition partner, they have two thirds. So passing bills are possible. Uh, having majority in both houses, there is no likely general election again, which is the common feature in Japanese politics. Uh, to change prime minister may be possible. To have a second election is not possible. So Abe might continue, given a no dissents with him. In such a case, Abenomics may succeed to some extent. Uh, that is his effort. Since he likes India, I think India-Japan relation during our period, nothing but to succeed. Thank you.